time to stop just surviving and it's time to begin to thrive it's time to live happier and healthier turn stress into strength noted author debbie mandel will show you how to move beyond personal doubts and fears and into positive perception to turn on your inner light here's your host debbie mandel greetings everyone and welcome to my show our guest expert is Rick Hansen, Ph.D., a neuropsychologist, meditation teacher, co-founder of Wellspring Institute for Neuroscience and Contemplative Wisdom, and co-author of Buddha's Brain. Learn how to strengthen, stimulate, and even change your brain to improve your life. Welcome, Rick. Great. I'm very happy to be here. I'm glad you're not a captive. <laughs> okay. Now, why Buddha's brain as opposed to Moses's or Christ's brain? Great question. Um, the Buddha is someone who's been seen in history, I think, uh, as a person who did not claim any supernatural powers, but who through his own efforts um, found an unshakable peace and uh, love. Uh, that was not rattled by changing conditions. And so uh, in human history, I think he's, he's been a model of that. Um, and so just as if you want to get good at anything, whether it's you know cooking or golf or anything, you want to study people that are good at it, it makes sense to uh, investigate people who themselves have achieved very high levels of what we all want, which is to be happy and loving and wise. And so by in the book, um, using the current science on people in peak states of, of, of experiencing or well-being, or people who've really trained their own minds, like through the contemplatives of different traditions, including the Christian tradition, for example, or the, or the Jewish tradition, um, you can then start to realize, wow, what's going on inside their brains when they're happy, when they're caring, when they're calm, when they're not so rattled by stress? And then the important point, how can I myself stimulate those brain states that underlie the states of mind that I really care about, which is to say being calm, being happy, being loving, being cheerful, you know, being resilient. So that's what the book is about. And that's why I use, you know, the Buddha as an example of the Buddha, of Buddha's brain. Plus, honestly, Buddha has a B. Brain has a B. You know, it kind of oh, works Oh, you were alliterative. <laughs> oh, yeah. But maybe for me, the concept of Buddhism is empirical, uh, empirical evidence. It's based on my experience uh, as seeing, as believing, so to speak, as and, and is really compatible with the major religions. I think that's also really true, and, and I'm... I, the book is not about, it, it's not, it's a little bit about Buddhism as a model of uh, how the mind works that's very consistent with Western psychology and neurology. Um, and also, definitely, it's a, a kind of profoundly practical psychology that is very consistent as well with Western science in that it's empirical, as you were saying, it's evidence based. And it's pragmatic. It doesn't ask people to take anything on faith alone. So for that reason, uh, Buddhism has had, of all the contemplative traditions in the world, it's had the most intersection, really, with Western science. And so there's the most material there that I could mine, you know, for my book. Um, and as well, Buddhism is very consistent with other faiths. I mean, I have great respect for other religious traditions and so forth. The book is not a religious book per se, it's really an operating manual for your own brain, uh, as well as a whole bunch of tools. It's a, it's a toolbox as well. Um, but the takeaway point is, to, is for individuals to really realize that, you know, there really are little things you can do every day to gradually change your brain for the better. And if you can change your brain for the better, you can change your life for the better from the inside out. Apropos you know, to that, I liked that phrase that you had in Buddha's brain, the law of little things. Right. Because sometimes we get unrealistic expectations and we create our own suffering uh, by what we imagine. We have a crystal ball. So could you explain that law of little things, what 
our listeners can really do to get a handle on their suffering? Sure. Well, there's a famous saying from neuroscience, neurons that fire together, wire together. In other words, uh, if we put our mind, if we put our thoughts on, for example, a negative theme like resentment, regrets, you know, the inner wrangle in our head that we're having with another person where, where we're making a case about how they wronged us and did us bad and are bad and, and so forth. Well, if we do that, we're going to be firing all those neurons together and they're going to be gradually wiring circuits literally inside our own brain of, of regret, depression, anxiety, feelings of inadequacy, a chip on the shoulder, irritability, and so forth. On the other hand, if we put our mind on more positive themes that are based in reality, of course, that's critically important, that are factually the case, such as our own good qualities or the little things to be grateful for every day or the, the small accomplishments that every day is full of, if we do that, then we're going to get those neurons firing together and therefore gradually wiring the neural basis uh, of positive mood, uh, optimism, resilience, self-confidence, an open heart, and so forth. And each single moment that we dwell on either, let's say, um, some kind of grinding resentment we have, or on the other hand, a moment of gratitude, each little moment is only going to build a tiny, tiny bit of neural structure. But it's the gradual accumulation of that over time that inclines the brain and therefore inclines the mind in an increasingly negative or positive direction. And for me, the what's really wonderful about this is that it's, it's the realization that just like going to the gym, you know, you lift weights, you build muscles, or you do activities in life where you work different muscles, the muscles get bigger in the same way, just as that happens gradually, you know, muscles change gradually, you can gradually change your own brain, and that puts you in the driver's seat of your own life uh, in terms of how you experience life. You know, there's, we don't have much control over big events, like the American economy, 9-11, Al-Qaeda, uh, politics, you know, Fox News, whatever. Mm -hmm. We don't have much control over that. Layoffs, health insurance, craziness, or, you know, the kind of attitude our teenagers give us, or, the, or the, what happens in our parents, you know, who are getting old, let's say. But we do have a lot of influence over what actually happens inside our own brain. Now, I agree with all of this, yet, as you yourself put it, there's a negativity bias. Mm -hmm. And we're hardwired from an evolutionary standpoint to be hypervigilant, to be more anxious. Those negative memories take hold. The resentment, we are wired to self-justify. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. That makes me right and you wrong. So knowing, many of us by now know that yes, I should be kind. Yes, I should give this a compassionate spin. What keeps us from that kind of hovering over ourselves with this genuine awareness to give everything a positive reframing. Well, your, your point's an excellent one, and, and one of the things that really has stood out um, in the last 10 years, I'd say, of research on how the brain well, works. Well, we now. have to hold that thought. I'm coming right back. All right. We're going to commercial break, the Good. mundane world, and we will return with Dr. Rick Hansen author of Buddha's Brain. Now you can take Debbie Mandel home with you. Her book, Turn On Your Inner Light, Fitness for Body, Mind, and Soul, will help you decompress with healthy, positive, concrete solutions. Common life challenges are presented so that you can quickly find the help you need. Emotional tips, original meditations, and a fun and easy-to-follow fitness workout for each mindset. This revolutionary new method will help you rewire mind and body to take back your power. Get it on Amazon. You're listening to the Turn On Your Inner Light Show. I'm your host, Debbie Mandel, and I'm speaking with Dr. Rick Hansen, author of Buddha's Brain. 
Okay, Rick, before commercial break, I hurled a ton of questions uh, <laughs> dealing with Neanderthal man to the present that's right. about how negative memories and resentment take hold. Yeah. Well, I was saying that um, a major area of, of um, insight in science the last five, ten years in terms of research on the brain and how the brain evolved um, over millions of years, literally, uh, is to really appreciate what scientists call its negativity bias. In other words, uh, our ancient ancestors needed to go get carrots, and they needed to avoid sticks. But of the two, um, you know, dodging sticks usually has more of an impact on day-to-day -day survival. Because if you fail to get a carrot today, you'll probably have a good chance at one tomorrow. But if you fail to avoid a stick today, whap, you know, no more carrots forever. So as a result, um, typically in relationships, for example, it takes about five positive interactions to equal a single negative one. In other words, a negative interaction is, you know, is, is more powerful than you know, four positive interactions. And uh, there are lots of other examples of that as well. So the problem is, great, or just oh, basically okay, at the end of the day, what's the one thing we think about? You know, we don't think about the 50 things that went right. We think about the one thing that went wrong, right? It's and like so, that, that stain on a white blouse. There's a little stain. The rest of the white blouse is fine, right. but we're drawn to the that's stain. That's I go to, exactly. Or as I put it, the brain is like Velcro for negative experiences, but Teflon for positive ones. So that said, I'm a very um, stubborn, independent kind of person who really believes in self-reliance and doing what you can and getting off your tush to do what you can. And so I think, okay... That's how the deck is stacked against us. In other words, the deck is stacked in the brain for passing on gene copies, for survival, but it's stacked against quality of life. So if we want to have quality of life, particularly for people who are going to live past 35, which was probably you know, the average lifespan uh, over the last you know, two million years of you know, tool-making ancestors, um, if we want to live well and live long, um, we need to take up arms inside our own head. In other words, we need to take action inside our own awareness a number of little times a day. And so I'll, if I could give you a couple of practical suggestions here. Um, these are things taken from the book, but they're based in science um, and, and very useful in my own experience. So is that okay? Can I do that? I'm delighted. You have me all attention. I'm mesmerized. Go ahead. Okay. Well... I'm always interested in stuff real people can do in real life. I mean, it's great to go off on a meditation retreat. I've done a number of them myself, and um, it's you know if you, if you want to go off in a cave for a year, you know, God bless you. But in real life, with kids, with jobs, with layoffs, with everything, uh, what can you actually do day to day, you know, to change your brain uh, and therefore change your life? Um, one thing to do is half a dozen times a day, or at least a few times a day, do what I call taking in the good, which has three basic steps to it. And here they are, and people can do it even as they listen here. First step, turn positive facts into positive experiences. In other words, lots of times, good things have happened. They're objectively real. In other words, we've accomplished some little thing like folding the laundry or getting the kids to bed or you know, finishing a day of work or something like that. Or a good event has occurred, someone's been nice to us, or it's just literally it's a beautiful morning, you know, or the flowers are blooming. The bus is on time, okay? <laughs> or we notice something good in ourselves. But often that happens, the good fact happens, but it doesn't move the needle. So the first step of taking the good is to let yourself have a natural response to a good fact by feeling a little bit of positive well-being, all right? There may also be anxiety or irritation or physical pain and all the rest of that, but amidst all that, there is that positive experience. So focus on that, which then takes you to the second step of savoring it. You've got to get those neurons firing together for 10, 20, 30 seconds in a row to really build to neural structure. Um, negative experiences have, have fast-track systems, so neural structure gets built, whap, just like that. But we have to trick the mind. We have to trick the emotional memory systems of the brain by focusing on this positive experience for, you know, 15, 30 seconds in a row. That's not a bad thing, though, to really savor it, to really relish it, to enjoy it. 
No one needs to know that you're feeling good. You could just keep a poker face. Yeah, you don't want to. You don't want to mis you, uh, mislead people with feeling good. You don't want them to catch that. Yeah, gee, <laughs> you, you know, know you don't want to reveal that you're happy because they might get mad at you for being happy or something, which is sometimes true, unfortunately. Yes. Anyway, and then the third step is to prime the memory circuits of the brain by sensing and intending that this positive experience is thinking. You know, people do this in different ways. Some visualize a golden light coming in with kids. And by the way, this is a phenomenal technique with kids. I have them imagine a jewel going into a treasure chest in their heart or imagine that like water's going into a sponge. These good experiences are sinking into themselves. Or just simply know that this positive experience, based on science, is wiring neurons together. Now, any single time you do this won't change your life, right? But if you do it a handful of times every day, within a few weeks, everyone I've ever known who uses this method talks about a, a growing degree of optimism, positive mood, happiness, and appreciation. And it also creates positive cycles. Since, that, since if you're starting to feel a little better, you're going to notice more good information out there in the world, right? It's when we feel bad that we tend to notice the bad news in the world. When we feel good, we notice. And we have to, as you say, build up a resilience against the evening news. Uh, what I would add to this equation, I'm big on verbiage, and I think we have to watch the way we speak to ourselves and others. When I hear people telling me they're crazy, busy, and stressed out, well, you will actualize your words. Mm -hmm. A word said is never dead, according to Emily Dickinson. And I think that's very important for self-hypnosis. Watch your words to other people. Make them kinder, more positive. Also, I see neuroplasticity in a very uh, physical way. I do it at the gym. I think exercise is a way. Uh, didn't Fred Gage write this article, Lobes of Steel, and that we could really rewire our brain for the better, release endorphins, release stress, right, uh, with uh, exercise. Oh, I think exercise is the other vitamin E, and I completely agree with you. I mean, it's very interesting when you look at the kinds of things that people can do um, for their brain. I would say there are three that really stand out. Um, I'd say four. Um, four super keys. Number one, as much as you can, open up to and encourage positive emotions. That doesn't mean being a you know Pollyanna or looking at the world through rose-colored glasses. It means taking a stand inside your head, since you know Mother Nature is stacked against us. You know, for actively uh, dwelling on um, little bits and mild positive emotions. That's the first. The second thing is to really be careful about stress. As soon as you start feeling stressed, do little things to calm the body down, like long exhalations or relaxing the tongue. Those are two little tricks that help calm down the sympathetic nervous system. That lights well, we're going to go back for part t for the two more. Cool. Hands-on. We're going to commercial break and return with Buddha's Brain by Dr. Rick Hansen. Are you overwhelmed with the burden of taking care of children, parents, or both? Are you taking care of everyone else except yourself? It's time to change your habits and re-energize. Debbie Mandel gives you an innovative and easy-to-follow program for good health and happiness. In her magical new book, Changing Habits, the Caregiver's Total Workout, Debbie Mandel shows you step-by-step how to find the optimal balance between giving and receiving and guides you to exercise and eat right to take care of yourself. What are you waiting for? Read Changing Habits and start training for your life. Life does not need to be a burden. Get Changing Habits, the caregiver's total workout on Amazon. Dear listeners, I'm excited to tell you about my new book, Addicted to Stress. This is the message you need to hear. Are you addicted to stress? Do you do it all while everyone depends on you? Where's all this pressure coming from? It is coming from inside you. This is why my publisher, John Wiley, asked me to write 
Addicted to Stress, a woman's seven-step program to reclaim joy and spontaneity in life. This fun-to-read book teaches proven strategies to reclaim your life, silence your inner critic, build a healthy body, and reframe your thoughts to change your life for the better. Dare to be happy without the guilt. Addicted to Stress is easy to get. It's available at Barnes & Noble and other fine bookstores everywhere. You can also buy it at Amazon and other online retailers. back with Dr. Rick Hansen helping us to achieve a more positive perception. Okay, your next two points. Okay, so first one, uh, have positive emotions as much as you can, you know, without being phony about it. Number two, <laughs> really initiate a kind of calming, dampening response to stress when you get stressed by life, which is, you know, all around us. I think if stress is like being jabbed by a thousand toothpicks, you know, that's a lot of daily existence in you know, modern America. Um, the third suggestion uh, or main kind of headline is to experience um, a positive connection with others. Uh, we evolved to be the most social animal on the planet. Um, the brain has actually tripled in size since our um, ancestors first began making uh, stone tools about two and a half million years ago. And much if not the majority of that build out of, of cortical volume of the brain has to do with with relational functions like language, cooperative planning, empathy, bonding, attachment, love, altruism, and so forth. And so, you know, uh, resting in the felt sense of being cared for and connected with others is wonderfully nurturing to the brain and really helps keep building positive neural structures. And then the fourth you know, main headline is just what you said, Debbie, it's exercise. You know, exercise does so many good things in the brain, including promoting what's called neurogenesis, which has only been discovered in the last few years, which is the building, the birthing of brand new brain cells. In other words, until just a few years ago, it was believed that, you know, basically uh, the neurons you had in your head and the day you were born is all, were all the neurons you were ever going to get, right? But what has been discovered is that we, you know, the brain uh, builds, you know, a thousand or so or more uh, new little baby neurons every day, particularly if people exercise. You know, exercise is very important, and that building of new neurons goes to being able to have um, a sharp memory as we age, you know, uh, and, per, you know, reduce the impact of the cognitive decline due to aging and so forth. And I think that if we combine what you're talking about, this kind of meditational mode, and with exercise, so if I have an intention for my workout, like these legs will carry me to my next happiness if I'm going through a divorce, that could help me. I think that's fusion therapy. That's right. I would say when people, for example, are you know, contemplating exercise, which for many people is not their favorite thing, <laughs> uh, me included. I mean, I like being active. I've done a lot of rock climbing and mountaineering kind of things, um, sports, but going to the gym and just grinding through the routine or lifting that last rep, you know, which hurts. Uh, mm -hmm. So to motivate yourself, it's great to anticipate a reward as you think about exercising. So for example, if you think about going to the gym, you know, you want to imagine the rewards of that and feel them, for example. And then when you do go to the gym or wherever it is that you exercise, including going for a walk with friends um, or, you know, taking the dog out or something like that, when you do that, really focus on the positive experiences you're having while you're exercising, while your body's active, and sense that they're sinking into you. That will gradually uh, create reward systems so that the brain will want to do those because it wants to have those rewards. Or at least do it, <laughs> even if the brain never really wants to do it. But it's kind of like a moving meditation, and you're hypnotizing your body. To me, it's all 
forms of cognitive behavioral therapy, which I think targets things. Now, in the remaining time, it's gone so quickly. You talked about having self-compassion. How does that, oh, I, I think we're, we've done, I, I wanted to discuss self-compassion versus sure. self-pity, but I think people are just going to have to read your book. How's that for a tease? Oh, that's a great tease, and there are three chapters on relationships, so, because that's often where people most suffer and are also most happy. Well, I loved your book because even though I know a lot of the things, I learned a lot of science that was very readable, understandable, reinforcing, along with the principles. Kudos. Uh, do you have a Thank web? You very much. Do you have a website? Oh yeah, BuddhisBrain.com. It's chock full of freely offered resources. Uh, lots of great stuff there, including, gosh, PowerPoint slides from workshops I've given, many talks, many articles, many links to other resources. There's a section on science that's very user-friendly, you know, um, including great websites that are good intros to the brain, as well as lists of fantastic scientific papers well, if you're inclined in that direction. Well, thank you, Dr. Rick Hansen. Thank it's you, wonderful, Debbie. and I urge everyone to read and visit your site. Affirmation of the Week. Fuel your brilliance by appreciating that quality in others. And now for the latest medical trends. And here's a world's first. A team at Toronto Western Hospital has shown that using deep brain stimulation on patients with early signs of Alzheimer's disease is safe and actually helps to improve memory. So far, so good, but this is phase one trial stage, so keep that in mind. Uh, from Indiana University, findings reported from a new international study of healing prayer suggests that prayer for another person's healing just might help, especially if the one praying is physically near the person being prayed for. Lack of understanding and apprehension about anesthesia may lead as many as one in four patients to postpone surgery, according to the Vital Health Report from the American Society of Anesthesiologists. A study by researchers at NYU Medical Center have found that obese adolescents with type 2 diabetes have diminished cognitive performance and subtle abnormalities in the brain as detected by MRIs. It's very important for us to keep our children within a manageable weight because inactivity and obesity do not bode well for academic success. How positively you see others is linked to how happy, kind-hearted, and emotionally stable you are, according to new research by Wake Forest University. And resveratrol, a popular anti-